missing, but I guess you all know what that is anyway. It, um, it got to number one in Italy, number one in Germany. It stalled at number two in America, which I know disappointed Tracy a lot. Uh, but then the disappointment was slightly leavened when she got her next royalty statement that said she'd sold three million copies of that particular single. Um, you also, I guess, uh, know Tracy for everything but the girl albums. Uh, and also for her various collaborations with artists, including Master Attack, <coughs> on that very memorable, amazing song, Protection. Uh, Tracy's also uh, made solo albums. The first one was about 30 years ago, and the most recent one was October of last year. So there's a long and uh, distinguished career to talk about. It's all in the book. Uh, the book is very honest, uh, very lively. Uh, the book talks a lot about uh, the, her professional life, uh, the roller coaster. Some of it was maybe not all a bed of roses, and her personal life as well, including um, obviously her life with her partner in music and in life, Ben Watt. Uh, there's a chapter about uh, Ben being seriously uh, ill in the early 1990s. Uh, anyway, I do recommend the book. There's walk on parts for uh, Bono, Morrissey, Moby, and Liam Gallagher. The Evening Tracy Thorne met Liam Gallagher. We're not going to talk about that. You have to buy the book to find out about that. Anyway, please welcome on stage Tracy Thorne. <laughs> Tracy Thorne with half a pint of white wine. <laughs> um, can we start by talking about songwriting? Um, mainly because obviously you're known for the voice of Thorn, as Ben calls it. You know, one of the most uh, emotional, memorable, recognisable voices in pop music. But sometimes I guess the, the fact that your voice is so well known kind of almost overshadows the fact that you're writing a lot of those great songs. And so I'd like to maybe just talk a little bit about your, your songwriting and to find out maybe your... Uh, what strategies do you have for songwriting? What kind of aims, what kind of inspirations do you have? I mean, I think you're right. I think um, I do often see myself described just as a singer, which is fine. I don't mean to disparage that. I'm very proud if people like my singing. But one of the reasons in the book I included, at the end of every chapter, I included a set of lyrics that I've written is to just sort of remind people that a lot of the stuff I'm singing I have written. I think there's an assumption especially with female singers, um, to just hear the voice and not even wonder whether they're singing their own material. I've noticed um, a couple of women on Twitter complaining about this recently. Kristen Hirsch was going on about it, really ranting about, for her especially being described as a singer, seems an absolute anomaly. She doesn't consider herself a singer as such at all, and much more as a writer. So yeah, I think it's definitely something that's worth drawing people's attention to. I think a lot of people think, you know, when I collaborated with Massive, that they handed me that track, and I was the sort of, you know, the decorative female vocal on the top, and that can be irritating. It's nice to remind people that... Because when Massive it. sent you that track, it was like... Yeah. Boom, chuck, <laughs> they boom, sent me a cassette, chuck. this is back in the days when everything was still on cassette, and I stuck it on, and it did just go boom. <laughs> for about five minutes. That was literally the song. You know, where, where's the start, where's the end, where's the verse? Um, I had to kind of invent all that. So, you know, there was a lot of creative work involved in that collaboration, which again, yeah, it is good to draw attention to. So, uh, so. obviously, you, I mean, you've I've mentioned your first solo album, Distant Shore, and I mean, the songs on that, you know, you were, obviously, you were, they, you were kind of, in a way, still a teenager, a lot of them were teenage songs, yeah. but... You lay down a marker as being somebody who wrote songs that were very honest, very kind of vulnerable, semi-confessional. So there's a kind of continuity, really, isn't there? That's kind of what the sort of song that you like to write, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, I write quite straight songs, I think. There's, they're not massively poetic, often. They're quite prosaic. Um, they're quite subtle, which sometimes works against them, because I've written songs sometimes when... I think I've told, you know, maybe quite a direct story or made quite a, um, a strong point. And actually, when I look back at the lyrics afterwards, I think, you know, you'd really have to know what I was talking about to know that was in there. I think in the early days, especially, I used to write a lot of songs that I thought were quite feminist. 
But I'd sort of disguised them a little bit as personal songs, and I'd address it as me to you. <coughs> so it sounds like a love song, you know, an angry love song. It's talking at someone, you know, who's been treating me badly. But I'm kind of addressing the patriarchy, really. <laughs> but you wouldn't necessarily know that. So I think sometimes, you know, the style that I naturally write in has meant that, you know, some of the things I've written have passed people by a little bit as being easier on the ear than I intended them to be because I, I do slightly disguise things. You, you seem to kind of aim at uh, really trying to get an emotional connection with, with, with the listener in what, in what you're... Yeah, I do. I, I think, you know, I, I think the thing I learned I could do is just be direct, um, strip things away. You know, I don't, I don't think I'm confessional in the sense of, you know being masochistic, I always think there's an element of um, sort of maintaining a degree of self-respect, even when I'm describing something that might have been difficult or painful. I don't, I don't think I've ever veered off into the sort of Alanis Morissette, you know, I'm going to literally rip my skin off in front of you kind of approach. I do think you should remain dignified. Well, I mean, I guess that's, that's, the, kind of, that's the kind of golden ticket, isn't it? It's that, uh, like the buzzcocks, so falling in love with someone you shouldn't have. You know, I mean, I imagine, and from what I know about Pete Shelley, there may well, well have been a particular individual that he might have been thinking about, but everyone who hears that song thinks, Pete Shelley has got an insight into my own life and my yeah. own heart. So people see it as, they take ownership of the song yes, after absolutely. you've given it to them. And I think the interesting thing is sometimes, the more detail you put into a song, the more people identify with it. And that sounds counterintuitive. You'd think if you put specific detail in, you'd make it very much specifically about your situation. But actually what you do is you make it real and vivid. And strangely, I find I can write a very detailed song that does tell a story, you know, that did happen. And people say, oh, how, how could you have known this incident happened to me? And you think, well, actually, all you've done is painted a picture that seemed so real to them that what they did was recast it. <laughs> with themselves in, in a similar situation. So detail, I think, is key. There's, um, obviously, the, uh, there's a lot of the kind of X Factor singers and, well, uh, uh, and also singers who are, are great icons like Elvis and Frank Sinatra and the Supremes who weren't songwriters. Yeah. Um, and uh, there are so a lot of songs that you've also covered, you know, from the early days, right up to kind of, you know, one of your biggest hits, which was the a song made famous by Rod Stewart. Yeah. I don't want to talk about it. So you've sung other people's songs. Yes. And I wonder what, what, how different it was to singing your own song and singing somebody else's. Is there, is there a kind of a difference in terms of how you... Yeah, there is a difference. I mean, I love singing other people's songs, which is why we always did covers. And I am still a great believer in the interpretive art of singing, which, you know, obviously gets a little bit disparaged now. The implication is... You know, karaoke. That, you, that it's karaoke, um, which, as you say, dismisses what the entire career of Frank Sinatra and Dusty Springfield to name, but two of my favourite ever singers. So, yeah, I, I do think there's an awful lot to be discovered from singing other people's songs. Um, there's a kind of element of you being like a fan when you do it. You know, for me, listening to other people's music, as you know, a big element of that has always been singing along. I think that's one of the big ways we all relate to music. Um, we love singing along with songs and you kind of get inside them. And doing a cover of a song is almost just an extension of that, really. You're kind of inhabiting it as a fan. And what was it about that particular song that you, like, I don't want to talk about it? Because it was the song that it was like the first time everything but the girl ended up being on to the pops. Yeah, it was. Um, and obviously it kind of went straight onto the Radio 1 and probably the Radio 2 playlist. Yeah. Um, uh, but it kind of slightly skewed your career, didn't yeah, it, in it did. a way? We did it a little bit carelessly, you know, we'd done a lot of covers, often as B-sides, and, you know, we'd done covers of songs by people like Neil Young and stuff, you know, and in a way that song that was written by Danny Whitman of Crazy Horse is in that lineage. It's a sort of classic kind of American country rock style song. Um, and I think if we'd done it and put it as a B-side, it would have just sat there and taken its place alongside a lot of other songs we'd covered. Uh, but it came at a point when, you know, we weren't having hits, and our record company <coughs> were beginning to be a bit anxious about us not having hits. And we'd been doing it live, and they said, well, look, you know, it could be a single. And we sort of went along with it slightly naively, thinking, oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, and then it was a hit, which was fantastic fun. 
for the four weeks it was being a hit. But then we learned that lesson, which sometimes if you have a hit with a particular kind of song, you get a bigger audience, but you don't necessarily just get more of the kind of audience you had, you actually just get a different audience. Um, and that perhaps wasn't what we were really after. <laughs> and the last time you sang live, played live, was the Montreux Jazz Festival in, in 2000, yeah. 13 years yeah. ago. And it's kind of funny, because every time you're on Twitter or Facebook, the minute your kind of name pops up, there's always somebody from some part of the world that, uh, you know, says, Tracy, when are you going to come and play in Argentina? It's usually South America. I was going to yeah. say, at the moment, it's always some, somewhere in South America. Or when are you going to come to Australia? And, uh, and uh, you do become a bit exasperated, to be honest, because yeah. you're like, I'm not. And I keep saying, <laughs> I don't do singing. And, um, and then the next time you mention it, another yeah. person pops up. Why, when are you coming to Italy? Yeah. So... Are you, I mean, is it kind of stubborn? What is it? Are you not stubborn about it? Shit, bloody mind. Yeah. yeah. So, um, on the record, why, why do you not sing live anymore? There, I mean, to be honest, there isn't one simple, obvious reason. There, reason number one has to be good old-fashioned, simple stage fright, which I've battled with for years and years. Um, and I think through touring and playing live a lot during our you know, the busy time of our career, I just sort of got used to living with it. But it did mean sort of every evening, you know, building up something you had to confront and then get over. And that's quite a stressful way to live. And then when I stopped, I realised, God, I actually don't have to have that experience. I can actually build up to the evening and I'm not going on stage and I don't have to fight that battle. And so it became difficult, I think, to go back and refight that battle that I'd got used to fighting. So there's the stage fright thing. Then there's just the kind of logistics of it. You know, so much of touring is just so boring. The travel, you must know from the, the DJing years, you know, just the traveling, the, you know, airports, tour buses, hotel rooms, anonymous locations, a sense of not belonging. Um, I did that for years. And again, it's not a lifestyle I want to live at this age. Yeah, there's all that, but then yeah, also but it's a buzz, it's isn't it? The buzz, the buzz. The buzz. I mean, the buzz of the. You, I mean, there must be gigs that you can remember where you actually. Yeah, absolutely. Can, this is why I'm on God's yes. earth to do this, and this is amazing. Yeah, but I've done it. You know, I, d okay. I suppose it's a buzz that I'm really happy to have experienced. But what I don't have in me is a kind of yearning to recreate that buzz. If I did, I think you're right. I think that would outweigh the cons. Um, but I think until I have that. You know, and it starts niggling away at me, and I start thinking, oh, God, I wish I could feel that again. At the moment that kicks in, I'll do it, definitely. But I'm not going to do it just because people say, when are you coming to Argentina? But also, the longer you wait, the bigger this hurdle's going to be. Yeah, I know. And then I'll die, and I won't have to worry about it. Um, Glastonbury, everything but the girl, with Jeff Buckley coming on stage and doing I Know It's Over by the Smiths. That must have been a buzz. I was very, very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that was mad because we met up with Jeff Buckley in New York and casually said, oh, you're going to be at Glastonbury, we're going to be at Glastonbury, let's do a song together. Yeah, 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 like it'll ever happen. And Ben and I were booked to do an acoustic set at kind of, you know, two in the afternoon or something, one of those awful things, it's a bit early in the day still. And we were literally in our little backstage hut that counts as your dressing room. 10 minutes before we're due to go on and Jeff Buckley kind of breezes in going, hey guys, so what are we doing? I went, what? You're serious? We're going to do a song now? Um, so we worked out about the only song that we both knew was I Know It's Over. Um, and we kind of, he came on and we blundered our way through with him doing that thing of, you know, starting out singing it quite straight and then kind of howling. <laughs> um, it was chaotic. But was and also, you, earlier in your career, you duetted with Paul Weller doing Fever. Yeah, and, and Girl from Ipanema. Got Paul Weller to do the. But I'm kind of, in, and at that point, Paul Weller was like a, obviously a big hero of yours. Yeah. You know? And um, and I, I, I I've always kind of wondered if you you know when he sang to you, I've got you know fever all through the daytime, fever all through the night. Did you just swoon a little, or did you was it just a bit all too surreal for you? It was a bit surreal, and do you know what? When you're actually working with Paul, um, the swooniness thing is slightly eroded by the experience of working with Paul. <laughs> Does that Which, mean? Well, bless him, he's wonderful, but um, I don't know, just that kind of like on-edge thing all the time 
is a little bit of a sort of dampener on the swooniness. Um, he's, it, it was really weird. It was really hard to get him to kind of settle on what we were going to do. There's this kind of constant, you know, questing about for what he's going to do next, which I think is great, and I think is what's kept him going and moving forwards. Um, but he's not a relaxing person to work with. There's a constant sense of eyes darting around the room. Is this what I really want to be doing? Sort of hanging in the air. Um, which adds a sort of tension that's not necessarily a bad thing. But no, I don't think I saw <laughs> um, just, got, just Maybe it's slightly connected with what we talk about stage fright. But there's, there's a quote um, in the book, um, I've never enjoyed being looked at. Um, and obviously the, the subtitle is how I grew up and tried to be a pop star. And I was thinking that if you think about a pop star's life, you know, being on stage, being on videos, having your photograph taken, it's a bit of a handicap being somebody who will say, I don't enjoy being looked at. It's a total handicap. I mean, that's why, you know, the book's not called How I Grew Up and Tried to Become a Pop Star. It's not meant to be a sort of disingenuous, oh, I tried to get there, you know, but never quite made it. It is saying, I sort of acknowledge that I did get there, but it's about then trying to be that and trying to find a way to inhabit that role that works for everyone, you know, that works for the people who actually are buying the records and coming to the gigs and want something from you, which is a level of performance, and works for me feeling like, you know, I'm still being the person I really am. So there was that, you know, pulling in different directions a lot of the time, which makes for an interesting story, at least, because there's, again, a sort of, you know, an ambivalent, you know, attention about the situation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of ambivalence because, in a way, you know, a, a, you know, you're being a songwriter and the kind of songs that you write, you know, and, and the kind of life that you've lived, you can't help but reveal something of yourself almost every day, you know, through your songs mm. and, and being on. So there's that kind of you're self-revealing a lot of the time, whereas at the same time, kind of shy and I don't like anyone looking at me. So there's kind of is there a conundrum that needs to be teased out then, or is it just kind well, of what it's like being kind of you know, complex person. Or uh, there is a conundrum, but I, I'm not sure that it's a unique one. I think, you know, ambivalence and unease in the public glare and yet desire for the public glare are two things that go hand in hand, perhaps more often than we might think. And, you know, the ego that gets you up on stage in the first place combined with, uh, you know, self-esteem issues that cause anxiety, which might then prompt you to write songs and stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's, in a way, these things form a personality which, at its best, creates an interesting performer because, again, this, we, that's this thing of tension going on and ambivalence. Um, I, I'm not sure we do want to see people on stage who are just super self-confident, impervious individuals. I certainly don't. But I, think, I, mean, I think that's one of the good things about your story is that it, it kind of does offer that other way you know, that you don't, that, you know, like sometimes when the, there's um, uh, something broadcast on the news and there's, a, there's like a TV crew somewhere and there's someone kind of jumps up in front of the TV crew and like, look at me. And I always kind of think, well, actually the person who's gonna, we're going to want to look at is the person just off camera who's maybe got a little bit of something else going on in their lives. So yeah. there's a, there's, the, in that sense, you're kind of a good role model for the fact that you're, that, you know, as you say, you don't want necessarily to be looked at. It's not for you about look at me. Yeah, well, I suppose the point I'm saying is that being looked at isn't the point of it. I, I did reach the point, obviously, of understanding that that came with it. And it wasn't like I was doing my nut every day of my life. I did make my peace with it. But I think if your motivation is just to be looked at, then the likelihood is you're not necessarily going to be a very interesting artist. Um, just... The final thing, again, something that I've imagined, final thing about the singing and, and the live. I always imagine that, um, you, you know, you have three kids. So I kind of imagine that there must be an occasion where maybe it's a birthday party or something, and everyone's kind of stood around the cake, and they're singing happy birthday, and you join in. Yeah. And then all the <laughs> mums and dads just kind of go quiet, and they're like, oh, my God, voice of an angel. Um, <laughs> I mean, or are they a little bit more low-key? I mean, does that, in, that, does that scenario happen? It does a little bit. I mean, only in a... Not at birthday parties, I don't think, when it's your family. Um, 
But yeah, there have been occasions. You know, I've done karaoke, for instance, with friends, when you're all completely pissed, and it's fantastic, and then the mic gets handed to me, and everyone goes a bit, <gasps> <laughs> And I go a bit, because <gasps> it's like, what am I supposed to do? We're just all drunk and singing. And yet, it's kind of different, because... But I don't know, what can you do? That is the situation, I think. It just is what it is. That's just the kind of situation would be great to be a fly on the wall. It would be good. I think it would be a good film. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now, I, I kind of think about maybe school carol concerts. Or school yeah, I, I do go to the school carol concert every year, and I go with the same other mum, and we sit next to each other every year, and I do think, God, she's heard me sing these carols so many times now, and because it's carols, and they're like, well, pitched up here! And you, you have to sing in your funny kind of lady voice. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't really me, I don't, it doesn't really sound like me, but she's heard true, my funny lady is voice. Is it true that Jamie Oliver's kids go to the same school as yours? They did for a while, I think they right. moved. Because I kind of think he's quite a good human shield, because you can kind of go, don't bother me, <laughs> yeah, don't go, bother me, go no, bother Jamie, Jamie Oliver. <laughs> go and get a recipe of Jamie. Yeah. That would be a good, that would be a good uh, film as well, you and Jamie Oliver, like um, whatever, Stella Street, <laughs> in the concert. schoolyard. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we're at a music business conference, so I kind of w wanted to talk a little bit about the business side of things. Um, not for very long, though, because it's... Because <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Uh, well, there's not much of it in the book, and I was kind of a little bit no, interested. because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's no kind of mention of uh, management, for example, in the book. And I kind of wondered how... Um, obviously, you and Ben are kind of, you know, obviously a very tight unit, and I wondered if... if you know, why there's no me mention of a management, and kind of maybe allied to that, if you could reference Jeff Travis, who is actually somebody who appears quite a lot in the book, yeah. kind of, um, uh, almost that figure maybe, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, there's actually a couple of different things going on there. We did have a manager in the early days who I actually did make a decision to leave out, um, because there was a sort of personal backstory. She died, sadly, very young during our career, and I took a decision, actually, to leave her out of the story for sort of personal reasons. I just thought, you know, it's not a story to go into. Um, and then we had another manager later on who was just great and businesslike. And again, there wasn't a story to tell. What we never had was a sort of Svengali type manager who was um, semi molding our career and sharing in decision making. We never had that person as a manager. We did have Jeff Travis around from the very early days. I mean, originally, Mike Alway was that figure. He signed me and Ben both separately to Cherry Red Records. So he was our first sort of introduction to the music business. And then he left Cherry Red, and with Jeff Travis and a couple of other people, they set up Blanco y Negro, which was this idea in sort of mid-80s to have a kind of indie label, but financed by a major. So they got the money w from e. Warner's, WEA, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it was very much part of that mood of the time, that they would all come through the indie scene and post-punk and the DIY ethos, and, you know, just were beginning to sense that maybe that had run its course a little bit and there was a sort of burgeoning new idea that you could take some of that amazing creativity and ideology and get it in the charts and, um, you know, you can have money behind it. I mean, it's very idealistic, really, because I don't think any of us had quite thought through what the compromises were that were going to be involved. But what it meant was that from that point on, Jeff Travis... Mike always left quite soon, so it was just Jeff at Blanco Negro. He became like our A&R man, so he was the person we would play all our demos to, and he, you know, be the first person we ran all our ideas past. Obviously, I mean, um, Jeff Travis, um, you know, of, of, is, is a great guy. One of the things that he did was he signed Smith to Rough Trade, and yeah. in the book, um, there's some great Morrissey material. <laughs> Uh, which we haven't got time to go into all of it necessarily. Um, but I like the way that you describe the impact of the Smiths on your career, uh, you know, which obviously kind of resonated with me. We took kind of 83, yeah. 84, because at that, at that point, Morrissey was a kind of a game changer in a lot of ways, very yeah. fascinating, very captivating. You even began to kind of maybe take on some of his moves on yeah. stage, flinging your arms about and stuff. Yeah. So could you... Tell us a little bit about that impact and, and, and how Morrissey did kind of shake things up at that point. I just thought, I mean, it's quite hard now in retrospect to pinpoint what it was about them. I mean, there was something I still think utterly magical about the early Smiths. I mean, they had a combination of um, 
beauty in the songwriting, which for me is always a big component part. I'm not good on just noise. Um, so the, you know, the beauty of Johnny's guitar lines was key. Um, the drama, you know, the sort of emotional flamboyance, sense of humour. I mean, really rare, I think, to get all those things in one package. Um, they did seem like game changers. To me, they, they were the first band I'd got as excited about for a few years. Um, and there was something about their approach to songwriting as well that I felt chimed very much with the way I was <coughs> trying to write anyway. I mean, again, they had that very sort of, well, Morrissey's lyrics had that sort of kitchen sink drama, you know, a real fascination with the mundane, um, you know, that uptight thing. That and the, the, and the androgyny thing, I think, was, the androgyny yes. thing, I think, was also... Yeah, for me, that, yeah. was, that was exciting. Um, I mean, you know, there was a lot of that about. It's not like Morrissey invented it. I think we, we were coming through a period when, you know, there was that whole thing of boys and girls sort of having a sort of interchangeable look, you know, haircuts and fashion were quite androgynous. Um, he did it brilliantly and looked amazing. So it, in itself, that was very inspirational. And in the book, you talk about him inviting you and Ben round for tea. Yeah. he moved from Manchester to, he moved was down it down South Kensington? Kensington, yeah. And that's what, and he invited... But he kind, kind of befriended us for a while and used to write us postcards. Um, which were, you know, these amazingly sort of flirtatious postcards that would arrive. Um, and we'd be invited for tea. You were the kittens. We were the kittens, yeah. Dear kittens. Dear kittens. Um, and then I went round one day to tea and he just didn't answer the door. <laughs> I'm sure he was just in there deciding, I don't want to see them today. So I, I kind of worked out quite early on that actually, you know, being friends with Morrissey was something that you couldn't perhaps just take for granted. <laughs> Um, again, in the book, there's, a, there's um, something that I find kind of quite intriguing. Around, I think it was around 1990, uh, the Language of Life album came out. We sold half a million copies, mm. but um, you were kind of seemed quite unfulfilled, and you talk about this in the book. In fact, you, even a couple of years earlier, um, you know, you were talking about maybe you felt like the band was in decline, and we don't often have artists who are kind of honest enough to talk about what happens when you lose your way, how yeah. that happens and, and, and how do you deal with it. So I wonder if you could maybe just tell us a bit more about that. Well, it was, when I came to write the book, I was very aware that the most difficult bit of the story to tell was going to be that period. And I, I really did have to think long and hard about how to do it, because on the one hand I thought I could completely justify that period. I can give you all the arguments why we did this, why we didn't do that, why we didn't engage with this bit of music, why we took that path. Um, because they were the reasons we did it at the time and they were quite genuinely felt beliefs. But the point is, in retrospect, I do think there were a couple of moments when we made the wrong decision. And, and, and also just through being a bit, having run out of steam and, and the creativity being a bit low, you know, we just perhaps wrote songs that weren't the best songs and they were so inevitably made records that weren't the best records. And I just thought, well, I can't gloss over that. You know, I think the most honest thing would be to admit to that. And actually, maybe that would be quite interesting in itself, to sort of be honest and, and, and take a step back from your own work and say, look, it's, you know, I'm not stupid. I can see that this record's better than this record. Obviously, from, from the outside, you kind of... It, 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 again, it's like a, it's a little bit of a paradox. You know, you yeah. sell half a million copies, yeah. but actually it's, it, you feel... Um, Creatively, it was yes. really about the creativity, was it, or was it, was. it about find, it was, finding an audience? It was both. Well. I think it was about feeling that we didn't quite connect with people who maybe we would have connected with at the beginning. So there's that feeling of you know that you're sort of being your records are being bought by people who've come from somewhere else than where you've come from. I mean that shouldn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but I think given the people we were and how much we felt formed by where we'd come from in that musical scene. To have our records being bought and then be encountering people and doing interviews, for instance, with people who just didn't know anything about that scene at all. It felt a little bit like part of your personality being sort of rubbed out, that they would talk to us. You know, in America particularly, we were regarded as being this kind of very sophisticated, you know, jazzy pop act, you know, and maybe we were a bit like Sade, we were a bit like Enya, and I was kind of thinking, well, I can see there's a bit of that in there. Sonically, I can see the connection, but 
theoretically and conceptually, that's sort of erasing an awful lot of our identity. So I think we just thought, it's just not going to work for us. We could carry on down that route and financially it would be successful, we could tour with this, it, everyone would be happy, but in the middle of it, I think we'd just be thinking, how did we get here? Yeah, and again, in, in, the, in the book, it's great, that the kind of uncomfortability of dealing with that American, particularly that American audience yes. is kind of, kind of funny. But obviously what, what happens, in, and again, it's like a really, it's a twist of fate, isn't it? Because what happens after that period uh, where you feel that unfulfillment um, and, and is that Ben gets really ill, really poorly. Yeah. Um, well, as I say, luckily Ben contracted a life. You actually say that, in the book. To save us. you say that in the book. I do actually use the word luckily. Yeah. But it was, it was like you say, it was, it was, it was seriously yes. um, ill for a time. Yeah, he was in hospital for three months and then really convalescing at home for a year, um, and it wasn't at all obvious to what degree he was going to recover. You know, he had a lot of surgery and was very, very sick and on very <coughs> strong medication for a long time. And, you know, it wasn't by any means clear that when he came out of hospital, that was it. You know, you've broken your leg, but now it's mended, you know, back on the road. So we, we were going through a long process of reassessing lots of things in our life and thinking, what's the future going to be like? How can we make it work? And ironically, right at that time when we should have been at our lowest ebb, a sort of reinvigorated determination crept back. And I think a feeling that, well, look, where were we before, before all this happened? Well, we weren't very happy, were we? So, obviously, we're not going to try and go back to there because where we were there wasn't quite working out. So, if what this situation means is that, you know, we've got to live a quieter life and maybe operate on a smaller level, then let's make a virtue out of that. Let's tentatively do a few little gigs and see how it works. And of course we did and loved it. You know, we got out and did tiny little gigs. I mean, yeah, I say, I mean, you know, that if you'd seen our tour schedule, you know, we were playing old, you know, pubs like the old Trout in Windsor, which is a famous one of those little tiny rock venues. You might have said, God, poor old everything but the girl. You know, they were at the Albert Hall only five years ago. And here they are at the old Trout in Windsor. We were having a brilliant time. We were absolutely loving it. Uh, yeah, and obviously within kind of three or four years of that, the what you know protection and missing, yes. and uh, and and also you had children, so that kind yeah. of that, that second chance, or whatever you want to want to call it. I mean that that's got a very strong story. In, it in is good. I mean the truth of it is though that wasn't what we were aiming for. I mean it is true to say that at that point when we were doing those little gigs, and then when we recorded Amplified Hearts, we were as excited and connected to our music as we'd ever been and really loving it for its own sake. Um, and then, of course, ironically had a massive hit just when we weren't really trying to. You know, the Todd Terry mix, which people think, oh, it's such an obvious hit. You know, it wasn't done as a pop radio remix. It was done just as a US club remix, a useful tool, you know, something great to have out there in the US clubs. Even when it was first delivered, no one listened to it and went, oh, God, that's Hit sure fire number one. People just went, yeah, that's great. That'll be really useful. I've got in my archive a white label of missing. Maybe um, one of the first ones. <laughs> uh, with a little note from you going, um, do you think you could play this at the hacienda? <laughs> well, I thought you might like it. Yeah, I did. I loved See? it. Um, and obviously, it went on to sell three million. Yeah. So, um, just quickly, yeah. um, again, the, being. In this conference environment, I did want to ask you, a, 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 it's a huge question, which um, you've got about three minutes to answer. Okay. And that's about um, being a woman in the industry. Because one of the things that sustains you... No. Well, but, well, I mean, I think, it, again, it's, it's, in the book, yeah. you talk very much about some of your early role models. Patty yeah. Smith, Chrissy Hind, Leslie Woods, etc. Yeah. Um, and they kind of sustained your you know, sustained you in that early part of your career, knowing yeah. that they were out there and they'd done good work and you had allies like Lindy from the go-betweens and so on. Mm. Um, but you kind of, uh, it's almost like you stop, it's like you stop having allies yeah. somehow. And, and I kind of wondered if you could just maybe talk about that and talk about how, you, whether you think there's, you know, a, a particular, uh, well, obviously there are particular difficulties, but what are the particular difficulties of, of being a woman in that industry? at that time? Well, I, I do think that the period when I started was a particularly 
good time to be a woman in music. And the, the people you've picked out there as the role models, and you know some of the other bands who inspired us in the Marine Corps, people like the Raincoats and Slits, and you know there was you could make a really long list actually of women from that era. And if you tried to make a similar list for uh, ten years later, you'd have to think a lot longer and harder. Um, and it just wouldn't be the same. You know what I mean? There was things do change, and um, you know I often think that women's progress it does take leaps forward and then gets pushed back and takes more leaps forward. Um, you know, something happened from the mid-80s onwards to pop music in general. It wasn't just to women. But it did have a knock-on effect if you were a woman in music, which was that things just became, again, more conservative. And what people thought was appealing became more conservative. The, the way women were supposed to look, again, became more conservative. Um, you know, to me, you know, and I know I'm out of step with a lot of women who revere her, but, you know, Madonna was not a heroine of mine at the time. I didn't think that the sort of reintroduction of using your sexuality as a tool was necessarily a good thing. Um, it didn't, well, it didn't help me, you know, it might, and, and a lot of the time we do look to our role models for how they can help us. Um, and Madonna wasn't any help to me where Chrissy Hine was. So I think, you know, that whole thing of, um, you know, this is like a virgin, we're going to just be sexy again, but we're so empowered that it's going to work for us. I kind of thought, well, you might be able to, I can't do that. And there's a lot of other women who can't either. So if that's going to be the new game, then we're just going to have to sit on the sidelines again. And then I felt during the 90s, you know, that we went through that period when feminism became a dirty word and the whole lads mag culture, you know, just reintroduced what seemed to me just playground sexism, but just dressed up as irony. And at that point, I thought, fuck, we really have, we've lost. Now, I don't feel that now. I think things have changed again, but I did think there was a dark period. Um, when, you know, the kind of things that I'd been brought up on and I'd been talking about from, you know, the early 80s onwards, I just felt I couldn't possibly talk about that in an interview now. Everyone would just laugh. Uh, but, like you say, maybe things have changed a little bit. Yeah, I think they have. I think they've changed we're... again. I think there's been another generation now of women who've come along. Um, and I sense, you know, there's a lot more discussion going on now, again, about feminism and a lot more younger women standing up and have you know, reclaimed the words, reclaimed lots of language. There's lots of arguments and debates going on, which is good. I like that. I don't mind. Some people get very upset saying, oh, women shouldn't argue between themselves. They should be supportive. I think we should argue. It's good. You know, we should all say what we think and talk. And as long as everyone's talking about it, that's better than just pretending that actually everything's fine now. And talking about arguing, just uh, come back to Twitter and Facebook, mm. because, uh, you know, you, you, you have... Obviously, again, so, uh, some of us older people can fall into that, you know, things were much better back then type yeah. rubbish. And, you know, if we're honest, um, there are a lot of fundamental things that have stayed the same and there are some yeah. things that are different. Um, but one of the things that I think is a massive advantage to an artist now is particularly Twitter, maybe Facebook, being able to deal and talk directly to yeah. your audience, get across yeah. your ideas and your personality without being mediated yeah. through a journalist or a, a shit TV programme or yeah. whatever. I mean, is that one of the reasons why uh, Twitter particularly is something that you, that, you know, that you, you do spend time on? And yeah, I really like it. And I like to think that if it had been around earlier in our career, that it would have been beneficial because I think making direct contact would have been helpful. Um, I think, for me especially, always being mediated by a journalist was problematic. I used to feel I'd do an interview and read it back and not recognise the person who was being described. Um, and that felt disempowering. You know, I felt that the journalist had too much power, that you'd have a conversation with someone for an hour and their version of it was printed as the truth. And you didn't really have any opportunity ever to redress that balance and say, well, hang on, my version of this conversation is that you were an arsehole. <laughs> Um, not that that's what happened all the time, but that, that could happen, and that was, you know, a repeated situation. And with Twitter, you can, or Facebook or anything, you know, you can have conversations directly. Um, it's much easier to present yourself as a complex entity rather than a simplified entity. Now, I think in terms of the music business and creating movements, I think it makes it more difficult. I think now that we know that all bands and artists are actually 
complex human beings like the rest of us and that you can't fit them neatly into little boxes. I think it makes it more difficult to imply that there's a sort of movement going on which you stick a neat label onto. Yeah, I mean, there's also, yeah, slightly, sometimes you want a little bit more mystery. Yes, um, yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's an American novelist called Joyce Carol Oates yeah. who I absolutely love. Yeah. She's on Twitter. Yes. And she's like, oh, stuck in a traffic jam in New yeah. Jersey. And I'm like... You don't want to know who Joyce is. No, I know, no. I know. But then you don't have to follow her. You can maintain the mystery from your end by not seeking out that revelation and the demystification. You, know, you can choose to hang on to the mystery if you want to. It is optional. Um, I know that that's tricky because it's quite difficult to say no to social media when it's out there. Um, but I suppose the point now is, is you can have it whichever way you want it. If you don't want to know what your favourite singers are wanting to have for breakfast, then don't follow them on Twitter. But I also think it's it's a useful tool for finding allies. I think that's yes, something that I've, I've it is. noticed that you've managed yeah. to do, you know, that idea that you're quite isolated and yeah. uh, et cetera, yeah. to suddenly actually think, well, I'm part of a network and there are like-minded people and I have I've allies. Made, I've made tons of actual real-life friends through Twitter and most of them women. And I don't think that's any accident. I think Twitter suits women incredibly well. Um, there's a lot of female voices who you know, become very dominant on Twitter, but even below the level of the sort of, you know, star tweeters, there's a lot of other women as well who are just vocal, and again, who are being allowed to be vocal without constantly being mediated. Okay, you've got a, you get a lot of shit there, because if you're an opinionated woman on Twitter, you're going to get people who object. So what? <laughs> okay, I'm going to throw it over to the, to the audience. Uh, <coughs> audience, quality audience. You've all paid hundreds of pounds to be here, so get your money's worth and have you questions for Tracy. If you haven't, I have more. It's that moment at the end of the lesson, isn't it? She said, right, is there anything you haven't understood? I always take one brave person to start the yes, flood, though. Please, maybe brave I didn't person understand when you said that thing about... Yeah, the, the question was about the, uh, Tracy's book being Radio 4 Book of the Week and the question I wanted to know, how does that all happen and do you have an input into it? Well, interesting actually, because when they suggested they wanted to do it, they said, um, what we normally do in this instance is we get an actress to read it out. Um, and I said, oh, well, as it's a memoir, you know, shouldn't I do it myself? Because it seems a bit personal and maybe I should do it. And they said, well, you'd have to come and audition. <laughs> Which actually, I thought, well, fair enough. You know, there's a kind of style of reading. They don't know whether I can read it. I might be crap. I might stumble over every comma. So I had to, they booked a studio and everything. I had to go in and do an hour-long audition, um, which basically consisted of I read a paragraph and they went, oh, yeah, you're all right. <laughs> um, and then someone who does this for a living actually did the abridged sections. So I didn't have any input into it at all. They chose the bits they wanted and, you know, literally chopped it up so that I was reading things that seemed to flow, but actually there's been massive edits made all the way through. But it was, I thought they did a really good job and it gave, you know, a good flavour of different sections of the book. Um, and given that you've got five, ten minute sections, and actually to read a whole book takes hours and hours, it's, it's quite a task actually to edit it down to that. Any more? My son and nephew's band won a Liverpool Battle of the Bands competition, so they are hopefully on the cusp of a, uh, of a great career in music and hopefully that being a longer one than a shorter one. Uh, from all your experience that you've had, what, have you got any advice for the two of us sitting next to the one next to by the way is 18 today, so if you fancy singing happy birthday to <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the questioner just wanted some advice to a young band who are um, about to hit big. The tricky thing is, and I'm, is I feel now that I'm not sure whether the music business that, as I experienced it, and which I could give advice on, even still exists. Um, yeah, and that's being honest. I honestly don't know. It may be that a lot of things are still the same, but I'm just not 
at the centre of it enough um, to know. You know, clearly there aren't as many record labels around as there were when I was starting out. And many people would argue you don't even need a record label anyway, that you can do a lot of it yourself. Um, playing live has obviously never been more important, so that's an interesting one. I think if we'd been having this conversation a few years ago, we'd probably all be anxious that, you know, live music had gone and, you know, there wasn't going to be a future for bands. And obviously that's proved not to be the case. People's appetite for hearing live music and being in the room while people play is not going anywhere. It's actually increasing. So that's a positive, if, if, if you want to play live. <laughs> um, but advice, I don't know whether I have any at all. You know, they'd be the awful ones, like, follow your dreams, stay true to yourself, which is, which is kind of so much bullshit, isn't it? <laughs> I would say, some people say, don't, you know, just literally do what you want, don't ever listen to anyone. And I don't think that is good advice, really. I think it's just working out who's good to listen to. But you do need some people around you who you know, maybe a voice of experience, or, you know, some people, you know, people at record companies can be good. It's very easy to adopt an attitude of, you know, well, stuff it's the man, and no one's got any good advice. But if you can find good people, you know, there are people out there, actually, who can be helpful. And sometimes it is good to listen to other people. And be prepared to be penniless for many, many years. Well, I suppose that's true, yeah. But you know that would have always been true, really. Uh, any more questions? Yes. Hi, Tracy. This is quite personal, but I read that you were with a partner for 28 years before you got married. Why did it take so long? Well, I don't believe in rushing things. <laughs> you know? I think young people just get overexcited and they rush into these things. Um, the honest answer is we did it on a bit of a whim. Um, having never intended to get married at all, we just suddenly one day thought, oh, well, come on, what the hell, it'll be fun. And it was, it was great. Um, but yeah, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a big game plan, really. I think people sometimes think, oh, there must have been a big reason why you got married, but actually it was, it was a slightly frivolous thing to do. OK, anyone got one last question? Yeah, at the back. Hi. Hi, it's Tracy. So the bar has been set up that you think before that you just said you like a drum beat or something. Mm. No, 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 they did, they did that, it was Mushroom who put the track together, so he did the actual, you know, the sample and did his fiddling about with it. Yeah. Well, not, not strictly speaking, I mean, I always thought with Massive, the reason I felt I could write that lyric with them was because I thought that they already had that vibe about them, of a really nice mixture of being you know, sort of musically quite tough. And yet with the songs they'd done with Shara, there was already a really strong female identity to them, which was what drew me to them. I thought that was quite unusual. And I wanted to carry that on, definitely. So when I wrote Protection, I thought, I want to do it, play that up. I want that to be part of the, their image. You know, I think that's really good about them, the fact that they are these guys, but they always collaborate with women and that there's a really you know, it's sort of slightly playful sense as well within the lyrics. So yeah, I, I was more doing it because of Massive rather than the James Brown thing. But having said that, I know what you mean now. It's quite cool. <laughs> I'll claim that as my own now. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to draw the session to a close. Um, just a reminder that um, Tracy's book is for sale. Uh, that if I didn't give very good directions to the mezzanine, if you go it's back to where, where, the, where you registered, uh, but go back down towards the stairs, kind of at the top of the stairs, and there is a stall with copies of the book for sale. And uh, I think, or oh, if you don't know where you're going, just follow Tracy, because that's where she's going. Uh, anyway, thank you all for coming, and a big round of applause for our favourite best team. Thank you.